Hello, everybody. I'm going to give us a few minutes as participants uh, join us. Um, and I'm delighted to have such a, an esteemed panel um, of experts uh, with me today. Um, it might be just worth um, saying where you are, actually, if you don't mind. Um, maybe starting with you, uh, Professor Sundar. Hi, my name is Sudha Sundar. I'm Professor of Gynae Cancer at Birmingham. I'm a consultant in Gynae Cancer Surgery, so I operate on women with gynecological cancer, and I run a research program at the university. Um, I'm also the president of the British Gynecological Cancer Society um, for the UK. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Pierre Martin Hirsch, maybe you'd like to go okay. there. Hello everybody, I'm Pierre Martin Hirsch. I'm a consultant gynae oncology surgeon, just like Professor Sundar. Um, I'm the president of the British Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. So I'm very much interested in cervical screening and cervical cancer. Thank you. Uh, uh, and finally, Dr. David Jeevan. Hi, good afternoon. I'm David Jeevan. Um, I'm a clinical registrar in obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, I was also the recipient of a fellowship from the Wellbeing of Women in 2017, which uh, kindly made a big contribution towards my research in ovarian cancer, which is what I'm specialising in, and we'll talk to you about a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, I'm actually going to start now. We've got uh, quite a lot of participants, so... Uh, uh, let's just start. So first and foremost, hello, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to you all today. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for Wellbeing of Women's uh, Health and Wellbeing webinar, and it's on spotting signs of gynae cancers. And we're doing this with the help of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and I would like to thank them for all of their support. Um, I'm Janet Lindsay um, and I am Wellbeing of Women's uh, Chief Executive and I'm delighted to welcome <coughs> our expert panellists. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. Um, I must say I'm slightly daunted being on a panel with you. Um, you're all so brilliantly qualified, um, but thank goodness for that. Um, uh, so welcome to you. Um, if um, you are all like me and the word cancer fills you with fear and you turn straight to Dr. Google, our experts today will help you understand your body better, make sure you know the different uh, gynecological cancer symptoms so that if you're worried, you know when to visit your GP to get things checked. And that's even when uh, there is this pandemic uh, on. If you've got a question today, please do ask it. Uh, write it in the Q&A section uh, and we will try and get to as many as we can at the end. Um, and also do follow us on Instagram um, and uh, follow our website. Now, before I hand over um, to our terrific panel, and thank you so much uh, to you again for making time uh, to come and do this for us today. I wanted to uh, make a, a small appeal to you. If you don't know about us, then please visit our website, wellbeingofwomen.org. Um, uh, we invest in women's health research. Now, women make up 51% of the population and nearly half of the working population. Our good health and physical and mental well-being is absolutely key to the health of society as a whole. However, women's health is routinely overlooked and underfunded. Um, only about 2.1% of publicly funded research is dedicated to our reproductive health and childbirth. Wellbeing of women, as I say, funds research and we've made great strides. It was our research that found the link between HPV and cervical cancer. And today there is a vaccine to help protect against it. Folic acid supplements for pregnant women and ultrasound screening in pregnancy all started with our research. Despite progress though, there is still much to be done to save lives and improve healthcare for women. And the need for research is as great as ever. 
In fact, next week, um, Pierre will join uh, virtually, of course, his counterparts on our research advisory committee to review 19 new research grants. And, and we've whittled those down from nearly 100. So it gives you an idea of, of what is out there. Um, and the research advisory committee will then put forward to us the very best for funding. And this is where you come in. Our donations are down 50% this year, but we still need to fund vital research. So what you can do is you can make a donation today and the details are on the chat section uh, and also on our website. But please tell your friends and family and colleagues about us. If you work, get your company to support us. Maybe they'll even sponsor our uh, health and wellbeing seminar series next year. Do a challenge, um, raise some money. It all really does help. And supporting well-being of women means you're safeguarding not only your own health, but also that of all women, your mum, granny, sisters, daughters. And I think we deserve it. One final bit of news is, and it's very hot off the press, is that today we announced we have a new uh, chair of trustees um, and that's Professor Dame Leslie Reagan. We're absolutely thrilled, so excited. Until very recently, she was president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and she's also head of obstetrics and gynecology at Imperial. Leslie's standing in the world of women's medicine with her unrivaled knowledge and experience of women's health issues will be invaluable to this charity. And as I say, we're really excited. Now, I know you joined today so that you could hear from our experts. So I'm just gonna hand over now and um, uh, over to you. I don't know who's speaking first. I am. Um, hi everyone, I'm just waiting for my um, slides to load up, um, which is always a sort of moment of a bit of stress. Uh, but today it is going to load up. Um, can you see? We can see you. Uh, can you see the, uh, my presentation? No. Not yet? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start again with the sharing. Um, We've got it now. Oh, have you? Fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to you today. Uh, my name is Sudha uh, Sundar. I'm Professor of Gynae Cancer at the University of Birmingham and I'm a gynae cancer surgeon. Um, it's, it's a wonderful um, privilege to be able to speak to this audience. We don't often get to speak to um, people in this way uh, when, uh, and it's a great opportunity to be able to speak to people to encourage them to know their own bodies uh, more. Um, I've worked with well-being of women in the RAC panel, in the research advisory uh, panel, um, and I've enjoyed, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the scientific rigor and the, the, the care and the quality uh, that they pay to uh, scientific proposals to make sure the very best get funded. Uh, so I can certainly vouch for uh, what's been said about the well-being of women and its work. Um, so today I'm going to speak about spotting the signs of ovary cancer and womb cancer. I'm going to run through a few slides, but obviously happy to take present uh, questions at the end. So I'm going to start with the female reproductive tract. Um, I, I, I'm just aware, of course, my daughter is 11 and a half, and I've been telling her from the get-go, this is your vulva, Marissa, not your bottom end. This is your vulva. And I mean, she doesn't go outside and repeat it, but you get the gist. We need to start, be comfortable uh, talking about ourselves. Uh, can um, I just stop you for one second, Professor Suda? Um, we can't see your slides, so I just wondered if you could press, um, I think it's share screen. Uh, um, just one moment. I thought that you... Well, anyway, let me, I'll, I'm screen sharing now, it says on my computer. So I'm hoping that you will be able to see it in a few yes. seconds. Yeah? Yes, I can now. Okay, that's lovely, thank you. Um, so basically, 
this is the um, um, uh, hang on. I should uh, yeah so this is the um, if you were to cut me in half um, from front to back then you would see this which is basically the sort of uh, uh, a human body cut in half. This is the front bone that we have, which is the pubic bone. This is the opening of the wee pipe, which is where the urethra sits. And immediately after that is the vagina, uh, which is where babies come from. The vagina leads on to the cervix. Um, and the womb is like a pear, and in, uh, with the lips of the womb looking, being the cervix, and the rest of the pear being the womb. The sea anemone structures are the fallopian tube, and the little almonds by them are the ovaries. Um, and this constitutes the female reproductive tract. Just behind this is the anus, or where the, where the feces comes out. And, and you can see from where things sit that uh, it's quite hard to make out what's going on in the bowel dif different from what's going on in the womb and the ovaries. So they're all interconnected. The cancers that we're discussing today are ovary cancer, womb cancer, and then Professor Martin Hirsch will talk about cervix cancer and vulval cancer after me. So it's really important for us uh, to think about ovary cancer because we know that ovary cancer tends to be diagnosed later. We know two in three women with ovary cancer will be diagnosed at stage three and four, so at more advanced stages. And less than, just about less than one in two women will survive five years after the cancer. Even now in the UK, one in four women will be diagnosed as emergency. And partly as a result of this delay in diagnosis, or the difficulties in diagnosis, up to one in five women will receive no anti-cancer care in the UK. This is not dissimilar to the rest of the world and it really, is, it really sort of speaks to the issue that we, we need to be aware of ourselves and we need to be um, more vigilant uh, in looking after our own bodies and, uh, and uh, speaking to our friends and family about this. So typically, ovary cancer, um, occurs in the age groups of 50 to 70, although there, there, there are certain types of ovary cancer that happen in the very younger women, so uh, in, the, in the 15 to 20s, but typically the most common sorts of ovarian cancer come between the 50 to 70 age group. It's much more common after the menopause, so after the change. We do know that women with a family history of breast cancer or ovary cancer or bowel cancer could possibly be at higher risk of ovary cancer. So it's quite important to flag that up and that can either be in the maternal line or the paternal line. And we know that some ethnic groups, Ashkenazi Jewish uh, groups for instance, are uh, more prone to having the, the change in the BRCA genes, uh, which increases the risk of breast and ovary cancer. And um, Angelina Jolie, for instance, um, it has had a prophylactic mastectomy as well as a prophylactic I mean, removal of ovaries as well as removal of breasts, I think, uh, in order to prevent against the development of breast and ovarian cancer. So ovary cancer is quite hard to diagnose and we think that women make up to three visits to their GP before uh, they have an onward referral to hospital to investigate for ovarian cancer. And that's because it's uncommon. The average GP will see one ovarian, woman with ovarian cancer in about 400 patients. We think the most common type of ovarian cancer actually comes from the fallopian tube, the sea anemone structures that uh, I showed. Um, we know there's lots of different types of ovarian cancer. And the big challenge is that ovarian cancer sort of comes, um, comes on in a very non-specific way. We use the word specific in medicine, uh, you know, say if you had, if I have elbow pain, I kind of think, well, I must have something wrong with my elbow. The trouble with ovary cancer is because it kind of um, has sort of vague symptoms in the tummy. It's quite hard for people to work out um, whether they have anything that is that is worthy of investigating and people do tend to ignore themselves. So basically the symptoms are feeling full, um, feeling quite distended, um, so feeling bloating and feeling full and basically some people feel that they're not eating as much as they used to. Uh, you, 
uh, through persistent pain that can happen quite frequently, that's new pain, that's either tummy pain or pelvic pain. Some women complain of um, uh, increased need to go to empty the to wee uh, or a pressure sensation when they wee. Very few women actually complain of uh, having lost weight. Uh, and mo the most common complaints that I've heard are feeling full, feeling bloated, and not feeling like they, the sort of loss of um, not a, being able to eat very much. Um, we also know that uh, people should report when, when they have uh, changes in bowel habits. So if you feel that you've been regular in your bowels, but that's changed, either you're opening your bowels and you're seeing blood in them, or you're seeing some slimy bits in them, or it's changed from opening your bowels once every couple of days to opening your bowels every day, or the other way around, that it, um, it's worth flagging that up to your GP. There are nice apps out there. Uh, Target Ovarian Cancer is one charity that has a symptom app that you can put in, but there's other apps uh, and other symptom charts out there where you can, you can flag up your symptoms and, um, and, uh, and, and see where you are in the scheme of things and whether this is happening on a regular basis. I can't stress this enough really because um, I think as women, we have lots and lots of responsibilities and it's easy to just say, oh, my skirt size has gone up a little bit uh, and I, you know, my, I just need to exercise more or whatever. And the number of people I've seen in, in clinic and Pierre would have seen and David would have seen uh, who've, who've come, who come in um, actually quite unwell uh, and they've noticed symptoms over a couple of months, but they just haven't flagged it up. Uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite amazing uh, uh, to to see that really. Um, and we do know that nice. And in the UK, we've got strict diagnostic uh, pathways. So in terms of symptoms, if you have these symptoms and you report them to the to your GP, uh, your GP will do a simple blood test and look for a. a, a, a uh, biomarker uh, for a substance called CA125. Um, CA125 goes up in lots and lots and lots of different conditions, but it also goes up in women with ovarian cancer. So it's a sort of risk thing. It doesn't mean you have ovarian cancer. And if that's gone up, then your GP will uh, organize for an ultrasound. And if the, he or she is concerned about the blood test and the ultrasound, then they will refer you to a hospital where you have more tests to find out and you see a specialist to see uh, whether your risk of having ovarian cancer is higher or not. But it's really important to remember that these are relatively straightforward tests. They don't say that you definitely have cancer. It's just a possibility of it. So I'd encourage you to report your symptoms. Um, I'm going to move on now to womb cancer. Um, womb cancer, um, the, the key things we need to look out for is abnormal bleeding from the vagina, especially in women who've had the change, who've stopped having their periods. That's the most common um, way in which womb cancer uh, shows itself. And it's really important to remember that it's, this is not a lot of bleeding. Uh, so sometimes people will say, well, I only had a tiny few spots. I, it was only when I wiped myself and I, and we all have this way of uh, trying to um, uh, massage our symptoms into something that's not quite so important. Um, uh, but it doesn't really matter how much bleeding this is. Um, if you've had the change and if, if that's over and you now see new bleeding, um, regardless of the amount, then it's worth speaking to your GP about it. So that's the most common way in which it presents itself. But in some women, um, even from the age of 40 onwards, sometimes very rarely younger, but you know, usually 45 and onwards, bleeding that happens between periods or bleeding that's unusually heavy um, needs to be investigated because there are a group of women who will present, particularly if you're an HRT and, and you have some irregular bleeding, it's quite hard to work it out. So I would thoroughly encourage a menstrual calendar um, because it's, I think, quite useful. Um, the, nice, the nice thing, the relatively nice thing about having womb cancer is that it gets picked up early. Um, and so womb cancer is diagnosed early in early stage. And so we're often able to cure women with ovarian cancer. Not always, sadly, but often. Um, we do know that irregular bleeding can happen in lots of other conditions, um, uh, endometriosis, uh, fibroids. Um, but if, 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 uh, if you haven't been through the change, if you're younger than 45, 
and you have these uh, irregular bleeding, then it's worth keeping a menstrual calendar and reporting it to your GP. But only a very small number with irregular bleeding or indeed um, um, postmenopausal bleeding will actually have womb cancer. So uh, it's always better to report symptoms and to be investigated and to be reassured rather than not report symptoms. Um, there are less common symptoms, but I'd be interested. We don't often see women with uh, any of these, but this is what the CIUK website uh, says, and, and therefore I feel I ought to put it up. Um, certainly, sometimes your doctor can feel that your womb is larger than normal, or you can feel a lump. And if you can't feel a lump in your tummy, again, this is the other way in which um, uh, gynecological problems get picked up. People say, I, I had a feel of my tummy, and I suddenly felt that I, I could feel this lump. That's always a good sign to go, good reason to go and see your GP. And there are a few blood tests that can come up that, um, um, that can be an indicator, although these are very broad indicators uh, of um, issues. So again, typically womb cancer, very good chance survival and cure if caught early. Um, older women really in the postmenopausal groups are women who pass through the change, but equally um, it's important for women um, who are overweight or who are diabetic or who have high blood pressure to just bear this in mind that if they have irregular bleeding, then you know, they ought to get investigated or they certainly ought to flag that up with their GP. Um, a referral for womb cancer, basically testing for womb cancer, your GP may want to examine you and that's true for ovarian as well. Your GP may want to examine you. Um, uh, ex examine you on your tummy as well as examine you internally. Uh, they would refer you up for a scan, uh, which can either be done in the GP practice sometimes, or it can be done in hospital. And there's a biopsy of the lining of the womb. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable to have the biopsy of the lining of the womb, but it, you know it's 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 you know uh, it's it's very copable with for the vast majority of women. And the other thing I need to stress, uh, which is, I think, a really important message, um, is that uh, NHS has been working incredibly hard to keep the di cancer diagnostic pathways going um, as normal. Um, we have been trying our best to manage cancer as we would have done pre-COVID. Um, lots of work has been done in system safety to ensure that uh, people shield before they come up to clinic or people uh, safeguard, people are being tested regularly. So please report symptoms and please have confidence that if you do that, you will be tested and diagnosed appropriately and managed as we would have done pre-COVID. And the bottom line is that let's know our bodies, uh, let's report symptoms and let's look after ourselves and, and uh, our friends and family around us. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Pierre now. Um, Professor Pierre Martin Hirsch will speak on cervix and vulval cancer. So, can you see my presentation? Y yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm Pierre Martin Hirsch. I've got a long history of research in cervical screening, cervical cancer and vulval cancer. They're both predisposed by HPV infection and that's where the commonality of my interest lies. Over the years I've taken lots of research photographs of vulval disease and all the women have consented for their photographs to be shown for educational purposes. So I will be showing some photographs of vulval disease during my presentation. I always think it's important to put gynecological cancers in context with other cancers. So here we can see all the gynecological cancers and I've contrasted them to breast cancer, which obviously is predominantly a female cancer and lung cancer, which affects men and women. So all the gynecological cancers in totality add up to 20,000 cases per year in the UK. Breast cancer is obviously far more common as is lung cancer. When we're talking about gynecological cancers, they arise in five different organs. 
So keeping the keeping the symptoms and awareness of gynecological cancers highlighted um, in the newspapers and in NHS publicity is difficult in contrast to breast and lung cancer. So I'm going to talk predominantly about cervical and vulval cancer and touch on vaginal cancer. You can see there's 3,000 cases of cervical cancer per year in the UK and 1,240 cases of vulval cancer and only 232 cases of vaginal cancer. So vulval cancer is relatively rare in the UK. Ideally, we want to diagnose a disease as stage one disease, that's early disease. Usually when disease presents as stage one, we can surgically resect the disease in clear margins, and that gives us a good prognosis. And it's important that women are aware of the symptoms of cervical cancer, that so we can detect them early and do early therapies for stage one disease. Here we can see that the prognosis for stage one cervical cancer is over 90%. So if women report their symptoms early, we can hopefully more or less cure them with a prognosis of over 90%. With stage three and stage four disease, when that's disease outside the pelvis, the five-year survival is very low. Again, it's important for women to present early. So over the years, we've made a dramatic difference in cervical cancer incidence. We organized the cervical screening program from 1988, and we can see the effect of the organized cervical screening program. We went from 14 cases per 100,000 female population to around nine cases per 100,000 female population. And that's the result of the organized cervical screening program. The incidence is going up a little because the coverage of cervical screening has gone down. And we yet to see the effect of HPV immunization. What's important is that the trend in cervical cancer mortality has gone down dramatically because of cervical screening. We're either preventing disease or, did I, or diagnosing disease as stage one disease. So you can see there's been a dramatic drop in the mortality from cervical cancer over the last 40 years. So going on to the symptoms secondary to cervical cancer. So around five to 10% of women with postmenopausal bleeding will have a gynecological cancer. The majority of these women will have endometrial cancer, as Sud has already mentioned, because endometrial cancer is far more common. But about 10% of those patients will have cervical cancer. Cervical cancer peaks at two ages, at 50 and at 70. So the most common symptom related to cervical cancer is postmenopausal bleeding. When a cervical cancer grows, the cancer breaches the skin of the cervix and causes ulceration and the disease starts to bleed. And that can cause postcortal bleeding and it can cause bleeding in between periods into menstrual bleeding. So cervical cancer is very rare in women between 20 and 25. So although postcortal bleeding is associated with having cervical cancer, only one in 44,000 women with postcortal bleeding will actually have cervical cancer. That rate goes down a lot. Um, is the sorry has increased a lot in women over 45 to one in 2,400. So particularly women who are of the age of 45 
and over who have postcoital bleeding and it's recurrent should definitely go and see their GP and get checked out. Postcoital bleeding can also be a symptom of vaginal and vulval disease. 2% of women over the age of 40 with bleeding in between their periods might have a gynecological cancer, whether it's cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, or womb cancer. And if women get intermenstrual bleeding recurrently, they should also get checked out by their general practitioner. Other symptoms that might suggest cervical cancer. When the cervical cancer grows, it might get infected and that can produce a watery discharge. If it's infected, it might have an offensive odor. I've seen several women with advanced cervical cancer and the reason why they've gone to see their general practitioner is they're complaining of a foul smelling vaginal discharge. Sometimes that discharge might be blood stained. When the cancer is getting advanced and invading the sur surrounding tissues, it might cause pelvic pain and pain on intercourse and back pain. So the management, if somebody's got symptoms suggestive of cervical cancer or gynecological cancer, they should go and see their GP. The GP should take a history, do a general examination, and do a gynecological examination, which must include a speculum examination, examining the cervix, just like having a cervical smear, and a bimanual pelvic examination. And the women should be referred accordingly to secondary care. So here we can see an obvious cervical cancer. This is from a hysterectomy specimen for cervical cancer. It's an early cervical cancer. It's a 1B cervical cancer, stage 1B. And you can see there's a raised ulcerated area on the lip of the cervix. And that would have caused intermenstrual bleeding or postcoital bleeding. If you do a speculum examination, a GP should be su suspicious of cervical cancer when they see that ulcerated area and they should refer the patient to the local cancer specialist. If a woman has signs or symptoms suggestive of cervical cancer, but not definitive, the GP should refer the patient to the general gynec clinic under the 14 day urgent cancer referral pathway to be investigated. If all suspicious, not confirmed women are referred to the cancer specialist, they would be overwhelmed. So women with symptoms that are suggestive should be triaged by general gynecologists. If women have a high grade or query invasive cancer cervical smear from the screening program, they should be referred urgently to the colposcopy clinic and be seen within two weeks. So I've mentioned the urgent 14 day cancer pathway referral. This is a standard form that a GP has to fill out to refer the woman under the 14 day rule. And there's a various tick boxes, whether it's suspicious of endometrial, cervical or vulval disease. And the woman should be seen within two weeks in secondary care. So not un unfortunately, not all women with symptoms suggestive of gynecological cancer are referred within the 14 day rule. You can see about a third of women are referred as routine patients with symptoms suggestive of gynecological cancer. So it's important that we educate people in primary care about symptoms that might be suggestive of gynecological cancer, and they should be fast-tracked under the 14-day, two-week rule. So moving on to vulval cancer, here we can see 
the age of women who present with all the cancer in the UK. And it's primarily a disease of postmenopausal women. And the peak incidence is women between 80 and 84. So it tends to be a disease of elderly ladies. We're looking at the trend of incidence over the last 30 years. At the bottom, we've got the different age groups and at the top, the black line is all the age groups. And basically there's been no difference in the incidence of oval cancer over the last 30 years. But there's been a significant reduction in the mortality from vulval cancer in the last 40 years. And that's because elderly women in particular are going to see their GPs with symptoms of vulval cancer much earlier. Elderly women used to feel very embarrassed about vulval symptomatology and would sit on vulval soreness or vulval ulcers and not go and see their general practitioners because they were embarrassed. And that's becoming less and less common. So women, particularly elderly women, are going to see their GPs earlier. We also know a lot more about how to manage women with vulval cancer. So the surgical and radiotherapy therapies for vulval cancer have improved over the last 40 years. But I believe that the important thing is that people are going to see their GPs much earlier with warning signs of cancer. And that's why we're improving mortality. I'll just skip that, that graph. So going on to the symptoms and signs of vulval cancer. On the right, we can see a woman with an obvious vulval ulceration, secondary to a squamous carcinoma. It's ulcerated. The ulceration will cause discharge. That discharge might be offensive in nature, in smell. It might cause bleeding. It will be sore. And if a woman develops a small lesion and it starts to grow, she should go and see her general practitioner. Very occasionally, women have a very small lesion on the vulva, but it spreads the lymph nodes in the groin. So on the opposite picture, you can see a lymph node that's become larger and larger and beginning to ulcerate through the skin in the groin and that's secondaries to the lymph nodes in the groin. Again, if the woman would have presented earlier, we could have salvaged that lady and improved her prognosis. So moving to vulval precancer. So just like in cervical cancer, there's precancerous cells, and those are the cells that we screen for and treat as precancer, preventing the disease to going on to actual cervical cancer. You can get vulval precancer. Both are caused by oncogenic HPV. It's increasing in incidence, particularly in the young, but both in the young and elderly. It, Quite often you get a discrete lesion on the vulva, but sometimes it can cause generalized inflammation. It can cause pruritus vulvi, which is itching or vulval soreness. It can therefore cause pain on intercourse. About 20% of vulval precancers, if they're left untreated, can develop into invasive disease. Benign conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, vulval dystrophy, and candida, that's thrush infection, 
can have the same appearances on the vulva. So again, it's important if a woman has those symptoms, she should go and see her GP and maybe get referred to a secondary care. And if there's any doubt, a woman should have a vulval biopsy. So this is how we tend to take vulval biopsies in the clinic. We put local anesthetic in with a syringe and needle. It only needs a small amount of anesthetic. And with a punch, we take a three millimeter biopsy of the skin. And most of the time we don't need to put a suture in the skin. So these are pictures of women who've got vulval pre-cancer. The most common presentation is pre-cancer associated with a leukoplakia. That's white plaques on the surface of the pre-invasive disease. It occurs on the lateral aspect of the labia minora. So those are the inner skin lips of the vulva. And that's the most common presentation of vulval precancer. Sometimes you can get discrete lesions. So here's two examples of discrete unifocal disease. Sometimes you can get pigmented disease associated with vulval precancer. So you can see the dark lesions around these two vulva. On the one on the right, you can see inflammation also, and sometimes you can just get widespread inflammation secondary to vulval disease. Sometimes you can get perianal and vulval precancer. Both are caused by oncogenic HPV. Anal cancer and vulval cancer and cervical cancer are all caused by oncogenic HPV. And again, if a woman develops these signs, she should see her GP. In cancer tertiary referral centers, there's commonly experts that del who deliver tertiary level care for multi-zonal disease. So I do a clinic with a colorectal surgeon specializing in anal precancer and anal cancer surgery. And we manage such women together. So as Sudha mentioned in her last slide, if in doubt about your symptoms, you should go and see a GP. If you're not happy with your initial GP's consultation, you should ask to see the GP in the practice leading on women's health care. Again, if you're not happy and you've got persistent symptoms, I would recommend that you ask for a gynecological referral to secondary care. And most importantly, don't ignore your symptoms. Quite often, elderly women in particular with vulval disease will ignore the symptoms thinking it will go away. And sometimes it's too late to do a surgical resection. So as soon as you get, get symptoms, you should get the opinion of your GP or your consultant in the local hospitals. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. So hopefully you can see my, has that come up yet? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, okay. So I'm, some of the points I'm gonna talk about are gonna be reiterating what Professor Sundar and um, Pierre have talked about. Um, and yesterday I had a, a chat with a friend of mine who's a GP, who uh, leads as the women's health specialist in her practice. And it was interesting to canvas her opinions on what patients uh, perceive 
from a, from a consultation and what GPs also perceive from consultation when it comes to gynae symptoms. So GPs have a wide variety of tools to investigate for cancer and patients that present may be very demanding and they may want straight away a scan or a CA125 test if they're suspicious of ovarian cancer themselves. But GPs, you've got to remember, have a very wide wealth of knowledge. They're not specialists, but they do know the red flag signs and they are willing to listen to you and understand where, what is what you are looking for and what they think might be suitable for you. So there, are more, there is more to consultations than just demanding scans and investigations. And it's important to know that no test is perfect and false positive results can lead to unnecessary investigations, unnecessary referrals and more distress for the patient. So CA125 only picks up stage one cancer in 50% of cases. So it's not the most useful biomarker by any means. And as we've talked about, many of the gynecological cancers can have symptoms which either overlap, therefore they're non-specific, and they're more difficult for the GP to detect. But the NHS has an urgent referral pathway, and we saw uh, in Pierre's talk about how the, there is a pro forma for GPs to complete um, and, and get patients onto the pathway, and typically that moves within two weeks. But before that, GPs do need some evidence to make those referrals. And one of the things that you can do as patients is to be prepared for your consultation. And now that might sound obvious, but there are specific things that GPs are trying to seek from the consultation to, to inform you and to, direct, to correctly diagnose you as well. So you should be expecting them, the GP, that, the patient that is, to expect the GP to be asking you about questions about your bowels, your bladder, sexual health, as well as your gynae symptoms as well. And an abdominal and a pelvic examination really is essential to a gynecological symptom inquiry and to a, a to consultation as well. If you had a rash in your arm, you'd be pretty dis unimpressed if the GP didn't want to look at it. So it's no different really when you have a rash or an itch that might be presenting in the pelvis. Sometimes patients feel really relieved that they've escaped having um, uh, an internal examination but that actually is a disservice to you as the patient. And other questions that might feature in a consultation will be about family cancer history, particularly about your mother and your sisters as well. So when you're booking your general practice appointment, ask for a GP who specializes in women's health. Ask for a double appointment as well. Most slots are just 10 minutes, but that's a lot of pressure, I think, for both you as the patient and also the GP to get to the, to the center of what might be the cause of your symptoms. GPs have 20 minute slots reserved, but it is up to the patient to request these. And as I said, you must remember that a pelvic examination, whilst it might make you feel uneasy, it is essential to getting a quicker diagnosis and it may even save your life. So things that you can do simply when preparing for these GP appointments is to dress accordingly for examination and also be able to show exactly to your GP where the pain or the lump is. Some things that simple are that you can do are always ask for a urine specimen pot whilst you're waiting in the, in the general practice reception. Typically, if you're presenting with bleeding, which is coming from somewhere in the front passage, they're going to ask for a urine test to check whether there's blood there or they might be looking for infection. What's interesting is that most patients do struggle to describe their own anatomy. Most patients will struggle with the words, with the vocabulary, and will point to either down there, their waterworks, their bits. It's difficult for GPs to interpret at the initial part of the consultation what the patient's talking about. So knowing the correct gynecological terms really is something that we need to do better at educating and making more women aware of those things and more comfortable with those words as well because that can lead to an early diagnosis. So there is clearly a work to do in, in health education. And your GP is going to be asking you specific questions about your menstrual cycle or when your periods have stopped. Are you on any new medications? And if you have got a main symptom, when did it start and what other symptoms have arrived with it? Again, you need to be able to point to the specific, specific area of pain 
Is it constant? Is it intermittent? You have to think about these things a little bit more before presenting to your GP, because these are the typical questions that they're going to ask you, and it's useful in the consultation. Bleeding is one of those things that patients do struggle with as well. We often ask them to quantify it, and that's because we're not interested in whether it's a huge amount or a small amount, but because it can be specific to the type of um, disease that the patient might have. And also the data for your last cervical smear test. Unfortunately, the NHS digitization isn't completely perfect. And so that data might not be available to the GP. So it's important to remember that data and have it to hand. And of course, we may ask you about unintentional changes in weight, particularly over the last three to six months. So don't be afraid to tell your GP about what's concerning you. It's very, very honest of you to say that you're aware of the symptoms of a particular cancer and that you think you might have those. And it's important to be aware that examination is so helpful, so crucial in getting you to a quicker diagnosis. These statements signal to your GP that your concerns are early, early on in the consultation and will improve diagnosis. And most importantly, gynae symptoms that persist must be followed up. You must ask for a deadline from your GP when they want to follow you up next, particularly if they've given you a new treatment or test. And if that new treatment or that test doesn't provide a result which gives more insight, remain calm, remain patient. The chances are that most of these diseases are not cancers. We, we saw in Pierre's talk that they're not common. But you do need to return back to your GP for follow-up because that's essential. And it may be a few visits before you are referred to the gynae oncologists. But if you believe that your symptoms need to see, be seen by a gynae consultant, insist on that. You have that right. So COVID-19 has had an impact on primary care, but in some ways it has become perhaps a bit better. The initial consultation now is likely to be by telephone, and that can actually be easier for some patients to talk to their GPs. But obviously an examination needs to be done in the, in the, in the GP setting, and that's face to face. But do remember to ask for a deadline for follow up. GPs are inundated with COVID-19 inquiries, but that, that does not mean that they haven't got time for your symptoms and your specific concerns. And referrals to Ghani Oncology have, were, were reduced during the pandemic, but the actual services that we were offering in secondary care never stopped. We've still been offering scans, we've still been doing blood tests, we've still been taking biopsies all through this time. So please remember that, out, that we ha are available for you. Outpatient specialist consultations still continue to be face-to-face, -face, although you may not be able to bring another member to your, of, your, of your family or with you to, to consultations just because of COVID-19 measures at the moment. And generally, cancer operating, whilst it did season some trusts at the very peak of the pandemic in April, most of us in, the, in, the, in secondary care have caught up on the backlog of surgery. Very few patients, in fact, were actually denied surgery if there was disease progression. And um, our, some of our targets have never been better at this point. Um, Janet, have I got time to talk about my research or would you like me to stop there? Because I'm sure we'll have questions. We do have uh, a few questions, actually. So oh, I, would you mind, David? I feel terrible. Not at all. Not at all. Oh, okay. um, well, uh, can I just say to um, all of you, thank you so much. We have had some uh, questions and I'll read them out and whoever wants to jump in and answer them, please do. If we can try and keep it as short as possible, I hate saying that. Um, it, one is, uh, can, can we clarify if post-coital bleeding is still an issue if it only occurs a day or so before uh, their period? Um, so shall I take that? Um, so basically, we do know that you can start bleeding a, a little bit before your period starts. This is a, this would be a question, uh, but postcoital bleeding refers to bleeding after sex. So I think if if um, someone experienced bleeding after sex at different points uh, in the in the month 
preceding the period, then it would be worth considering as bleeding after sex rather than bleeding just before the period. So this is a question of timing and, and working it out uh, in terms of um, how that fits in with regards to the period and the rest of the time. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is, are there any abnormal cancers that do not show up uh, as, ra as a raised CA125? Um, uh, do you want to go because I've... No, you're an expert in this area. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, unfortunately, there are uh, women with ovarian cancer that um, uh, we do know the, that CA125 is a good test, but it's perhaps not as sensitive as it could be in picking up uh, some women. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, we don't have better tests, although David uh, and uh, lots of people are involved in uh, trying to find better tests for ovarian cancer than CA125. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another one is, uh, can an inflamed cervix be an indicator of, a gyne of any gyne cancer? Um. So an inflamed cervix, somebody's had to have a look at the cervix to say it's inflamed. <laughs> and we would hope that the person examining the lady would do all the necessary things. So um, exclude infection in a young woman or women of any age, infection is a common cause of an inflamed cervix. So that needs to be excluded. If there's, if it's been excluded, maybe a small biopsy of the cervix would rule out cervical cancer. Um, uh, inflamed cervix is not an indicator of cancer anywhere else in the pelvis. Okay, I think that's that's that probably answers that. Um, uh, a couple more here. We've got um, uh, what level of, in fact, we've got a few on discharge actually. What level of discharge is deemed as normal or abnormal? Um, so I'd quite like to take this actually because this is a million dollar question and this is a cross cultural question. The number of women I've seen in India, in Africa, in Thailand, and the United Kingdom who are concerned about discharge, it's unbelievable. Um, so there isn't a particular level of discharge that is normal or abnormal. It's all about what is normal for you and what is abnormal for you. Um, we do know that younger women sometimes can experience more discharge because that's the time the cervix is changing and it tends to, um, when the cervix is changing from having more spongy lining to more skin-like lining, then it tends to give a little bit more discharge. Uh, so it's all about what is your normal level of discharge and there certainly isn't an ideal form of discharge that anybody needs to aspire to. I think if that discharge changed in any way, so it became offensive, it became blood-stained, then it would be worth um, flagging up. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is, does having had IVF raise the risk of uh, gynecological cancers? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware. The jury's out on that. Uh, so, the, I mean, there's been bits and pieces, but I don't think it definitely, there was some data vaguely that I saw that it increased the lump of non-cancerous, a uh, number of non-cancerous lumps, but it's never really been proven one way or the other. And I, I wouldn't uh, take that very seriously. Yeah. There's no definitive evidence. Yeah. Okay, that's that, that's helpful. Um, uh, one uh, of our attendees says she works in education, or, or he does. Um, can anyone recommend a helpful labelled diagram to use to help teach women the correct gynaecological terminology, which doesn't have copyright issues? I'm sure we could find uh, the resource. Uh, and I can I can let Lena have it. So. Okay. So what I can say is is if you're still uh, watching, um, then please get in contact with Wellbeing of Women. Um, 
and uh, we will uh, get this to you. I think it's very helpful actually, um, particularly as David, David's sort of uh, talk picked up on the fact that we should all be using the correct terminology. Um, and I'm sure it is true that um, uh, people don't. Um, another one here is, uh, is, can you get cancer? It says in the vault after the abdominal hysterectomy. So the vault is the top of the vagina. If a woman has had a hysterectomy for cervical precancer, and the precancer extends the vaginal vault and it's not been completely removed, in theory, you can get vaginal cancer. Um, and it's thought that vaginal cancer the majority of cases are secondary to cervical cancer. Um, and as I, I saw my first table, vaginal cancer is extremely rare, so it's not very common. Okay, thank you for that. And one final question here, skin tags around the vagina, can they be precancerous? Yes, they can. Okay. That was a, a very quick and straightforward answer. It uh, only remains for me to say a huge thank you to all three of you. Um, I know that um, you've had to try and uh, fit this in and sort it all out for us. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and I really believe that people will come away from this and be much clearer on the symptoms. Uh, so thank you, um, Pierre and Suda, for that. Um, and also, David, for your very helpful um, talk about um, visiting the GP. I think it's uh, incredibly helpful to have that. Um, so thank you very much uh, to, uh, to all our panellists. And also a big thank you to um, everybody who's come along today uh, and listened to this. Uh, and as I say, Please, please visit our website, um, make a donation if you can, and spread the word about well-being of women. Uh, we really need your support. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.